I want to speak to you uh, today and the next uh, several weeks um, through June, actually, from uh, the letter Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, uh, where he himself had not been when he wrote this letter. And so <clears throat> there's something very important, and there's something that's easy for us to kind of miss, I think, with some of that. Our lives are somewhat comfortable, right? So just to kind of give you a taste, we were all these different kind of places uh, in, in very kind of dire situations also deliberately. Our mornings were filled with academic kind of stuff like, you know, we're doing a doctoral degree. And afternoons were in the trenches trying to see how do pastors and ministers actually deal with things in a difficult situation. So we are on this place in Bronx where you, you prefer to be a little bit earlier in the afternoon. Um, and just talking to, to this pastor, young pastor, who had moved in uh, with his wife into an apartment right there in the very hub of the most crime-ridden area probably in the USA. And so some were asking him, so, so what's going on? And say, you got to trust the Lord. It's, it's not easy. You know, some people sometimes get shot outside right here in the street where we live. And, and they have, you know, domestic violence run rampant everywhere. Uh, and then human trafficking happens in several of these places around, and, and on and on. He listed some of these kinds of things. And, and you know, uh, faces of, of many of those who live nicely in, in, um, in areas that had seen none of that um, suddenly began to kind of uh, whiten. Is that a good way of saying that? A paling uh, and saying, how do you find the strength and the power and, and the word that comes up, you got to trust God, right? Can I speak this to you in, in a strong way? So there are certain things in life, many things that are really, really good. Things that you do because they're good things to do. You know, you call your friend or you, you, you love on your neighbor or, or you, you go buy something that is good. It's good. It's not necessary, but it's good. There are other things that are very, very helpful. Uh, and you do them because they're helpful. And you can think, you just think through all the many kinds of things you're doing that are really helpful. But they're not necessary. You know, you may sleep an extra hour, and that's very helpful. You may take, a, you know, an aspirin or something if you have a headache, and it, it's helpful. But if you have a serious heart condition and you need one particular pill at a particular time of day, that's not just helpful. That's necessary. You seeing the difference? And so I think what Paul is doing, and I was thinking about what should I call this series? Should I just call it, you know, like, like, like we have done earlier also by using the fresh uh, word of being refreshed. And, and there's a lot of power and important things in that. But I thought Colossians is really about Paul telling this church that there are certain things that are not just good, they're not just helpful, they're not just things that, that are really kind of useful in many ways, they are necessary. And so we want to start uh, with some of that. And that is true also here, as Paul saying that, uh, for our faith. The letter to the Colossians is full of necessary words. So I'll say today we're going to deal with the necessary word of truth. So let me read the first eight verses of, of the letter to the Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always, thank, uh, we always thank God the Father for your, uh, for our Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, sorry, uh, when we pray for you, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. You learned this 
from Epaphras, our dearly beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has told us about your love in the Spirit. Think about what's going on here. Look at verse 6 again. If you have your Bible open and it comes in here, just see how he begins here with this, right? Uh, the gospel. He's talking about the gospel right here. You already heard about the hope of the word of truth. It is bearing fruit, and it is growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate it. All over the world. This is a faith that is lived out. There's no kind of a privilege here of turning faith into something that is just a matter of, of belief systems that happens in your brain. And, and you see that when you're in the real trenches or where faith matters, it, it, you can't reduce it just to a debate about what is right and wrong in your head. It is what has transformed lives. If you really share your gospel with people, share your faith with people uh, that, that have no real understanding of who God is, they're going to look at you and they're going to say, so what difference does it make? They're not going to ask, what exactly do you think about the Trinity or, or how do you define this kind of theological issue? They are asking, what change does it affect? In your life? How is it that my life will be truly impacted in a good way when I come to faith in Jesus Christ? And that is kind of what he's, what he's doing right here. See, he's writing to this church in Colossae, and what had happened there was that, that uh, they come to faith, and then, uh, you know, other kind of ideas had come in. And, and they had reduced their understanding of faith and their understanding of Christ to something that is helpful, something that is useful, something that is good, but not something that is exclusively necessary. You know, it, it is good. Christ can even be central to one's understanding of things, but not in a way where you kind of say, well, this is what matters, and other things are not, not all that important. That, that is exactly what had happened there. Culture had entrenched in such a way that Christ was part of the mix. He was not the fullness of it all. And so some of them even were beginning to question Epaphras, who was their pastor, and they say, you know, after they hadn't met Paul, and, and, and they were kind of, uh, questioning and saying, you know, what Epaphras is saying is, is not wrong, but it's not all that there is. There are other things too, other ways of kind of coming to God, other ways of understanding the spiritual life, other helpful things. Even if he claims that Christ is important, he's not exclusively all important. Are we getting this? This speaks so much and has so much power in our situation. If that is not exactly what happens uh, when we look at the world today, especially in comfortable areas, uh, somewhat also like ours, it is such a, a temptation to make Christ what we speak about, and, and we have him part of the mix. But after all, I also learned this over here, and I take this philosophy here, and I do a little bit of this here, and, and my culture doesn't have to change. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean that I have to change my lifestyle. And Paul says, oh, yeah, it does. Oh, yeah, it does. What Epaphras has taught you, is the whole truth and the fullness of truth. Everything is found in Christ. And so, here we are. Paul is telling the Colossians, giving them a word, a necessary word of truth. Just look at it right here in verse 5, right? You have already heard about this hope in what? the word of truth, which is the gospel. 
So what he's telling them is that when the faith in Christ and the love for the saints and the hope in the resurrection, I mean, in the hope in the return of Christ, live among us in the strongest way, we will see that that changes the way we think about that. So let me, let me uh, unpack this and let us hopefully see this as not just good advice, not just a kind of a great word to kind of be reminded of, but that this is a necessary word to find the kind of power, the kind of strength, and the kind of spirit presence that we see all over. I hope you have noticed when you look at this text, and all I'm going to do, friends, is just kind of preach the Bible. Just say, what does it say here, and try to unpack some of these things. Right? Paul begins with what we may call the very constitution of faith. You see that right there. He, he begins with this kind of a holy kind of tripod, if you will, uh, and some of you would have seen that when you've seen some of these major houses being built. Have you seen that they, they knock these kind of uh, pillars down in the earth, right? Have you seen that? If you haven't seen it, go to Florida. Every house has that, right? And they just bounce through the sand, keep doing it. Some of them are massively long, and they keep that for days and weeks, hammering that down. Well, there are three of those that, that are tripod as foundational in the Christian faith, and that is, of course, faith in Christ. It is love for the saints, and it is hope in the return of Jesus. And that is really what we see uh, going on here. That's where he begins, and I want to kind of deal with this uh, as this foundational point, and when that is missing, we are missing so much. And Paul begins there for a reason, and he wraps this here as part of the thanksgiving. We always give thanks to God for you because, and then come, here it comes, right? your faith in Christ and your, your love for the saints and your hope. So that's what is, what is going on uh, with this here. So if we unpack this and look at that as one thing at the time, because what you will see is that these things go together. I don't know if you thought about that. You can't take one of them out, right? You, we all know that from a tripod. If you remove one of the legs, it's just going to fall down, right? If you just have one, of course, that can't stand. Two can't stand. Three will never wobble. It just won't. You know, if you don't believe me, try it. It will not. doesn't matter how uneven is the bottom. It will not wobble. And so when you take just, for example, two of them together, you're going to miss something. If you take faith and hope alone, for example, you're going to have this kind of wishful, dreamy thinking, I hope this and I, I believe it, so it must be true. No, it's not. It just lands you someplace where you don't have to really care for what is around you. You just live in your dream world. What if you take just faith and love? Well, that would end in some kind of social type religion. I, I just, you know, believe that it's important to show my love to everybody, and that is good. But it would leave you without that kind of uh, significance that would continue request that you go to Jesus to ask for his help. What about then hope and love on, on their own? Well, if you do that, then you have no real rooting in Christ. But when you put the three together, friends, they will work in such a way, infusing each other with power and strength and life, that you can see a genuine, new, strong, spiritual life become yours. That's why the foundation is so important. And it begins with faith. Of course, it's not loose hanging faith, right? We kind of gotten used to this. Just believe like in yourself or believe you can do this. That's never biblical. Faith is always faith in Christ. Trust that he has the power and he has done for you what you cannot do for yourself. It's always that. It's never loose hanging kind of faith. So this word, of truth is introduced with this word about faith. And it, it is about what it means to truly come to a conviction that life happens in the power of the presence of Jesus. 
You know, it, it is one of the paradoxes of the Christian faith that is at one of the time, same time, you know, uh, our Lord is requesting that we have faith, that is, that we trust him in what he says and what he does. And at the same time, that faith is generated in our heart by his grace. So there's a certain thing that preceded that has to do with the conviction that Christ truly is the Son of God, that he truly died for us, and that he truly rose again, that he's really actually seated at the right hand of the Father and judging the living and the dead. But the faith that we have here goes far deeper than just that kind of convictional thing. The faith that Jesus always talks about when he speaks is a faith that has, is visible, that it reveals the actual presence of God's grace in someone's life. The work of the Spirit, if you will, we can put it that way, is recognized by the presence of that kind of faith that steps out where it cannot reach the bottom on its own. This is really what's going on and the way it makes a difference to say Jesus Christ is Lord. Not just in some kind of sense, Lord and Savior, he'll take care of me at the end. It's not enough to say I believe in God. It's not enough to say I have spiritual kind of experiences. It's not enough to say I can pray and the sick get healed or I can speak in tongues and, and it's like speaking directly to God. What Paul is saying here is that those who are saying, well, this thing about Christ is good but not quite sufficient. There's so many other things also. Paul is saying, no, you need to trust that Christ is sufficient. You have faith, not in your own ability, not in some kind of, F, you know, uh, loose hanging kind of ideas, ephemeral stuff, but in Christ. It turns out to be faithfulness. Look at what, how he opens the very letter. He says, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are what? who are faithful brothers. That word saints is really just an English translation of the word holified. Those who have been made holy by God and those who are faithful brothers and sisters. Not just those who are. So this becomes a really important thing. Not only those who have the name, but those who have the lifestyle. Love is another part of that tripod. And, and as it describes here, it speaks to the love that we have for all the other believers. What we're talking about here and what Jesus, uh, Paul here, is, is focusing on is the kind of love that is uniquely Christian, that is so deep that it can't happen without the power of the Spirit, the kind of thing that makes it possible for someone to sit and enjoy it with someone they don't even know well. So we come together to worship here. Whether you're in jeans and t-shirt or you're in a full suit, whether you are rich or poor, whether you smell nice or you're pungent to sit next to, whether you, you are, are black or white or any kind of shade in, in between there, whether you have you know, no education really or you are like a rocket scientist, whatever that may be, together, young, old, everyone sits together and bound together by love. Are we hearing this? Yes. I'm not saying bound together by we sit in the same pew and it's okay, that's okay. But that we actually love one another. You can deeply love someone just because they are your brothers or sisters in Christ. That's the uniqueness. That cannot happen outside of the Spirit of God. And that is actually the visible the visible expression of God's grace in your life. That there is a love that goes to all 
the same. And then look. Look at the last hope. Verse 4, we heard about your faith in Christ, your love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope that is ready for you or prepared in heaven. Just think of this. Some of us think of it the opposite of what the Bible says here, right? Faith and love, according to this text, find its nourishment from hope. Do we see this? Because of the hope, you're living that way, huh? Because of the hope that is there, there's a deep sense of of God has put us together, and when we see these great snippets of, of greatness, when we experience a love that we don't know really, when we have the best day we have ever had in our lives, when everything that kind of looks up, we get a little snippet. But even that best day you ever had in your whole life will look merely like deep depression compared to the blessings that await. This is it. Because of the hope, we know what will come, friends, yes? And we see that, and it gets pulled back in. And we are allowed by God's grace to see just snippets, just little fragments, just little kind of corners, glimpses of what will be. And it will be so much more. So let us not ever lose that. The Christian life must be filled with Christian hope. Not long, don't confuse that. Not long for once upon a time or, you know, it'll be better in the end, that kind of longing. No, right now, that hope is what fills our life at this moment with strength and power to do this. I'm going to say just a couple of words and then I'll round it up here about hope. We go to, to uh, the, the letter to, to the Hebrews. Hope there is defined as the anchor of the soul. Just think about this. Because without that anchor, life is kind of drifting around in the open sea with no direction and no ground. When you go to the prophet Joel, he calls it for the harbor. And kind of the image there is that, that the harbor is this place where you come in from the raging sea and find kind of peace. You get your, your storage rooms filled back up and you get repaired and ready to sail again on the sea. And Hosea, the prophet, calls it for a door, right? The hope is like a door, and it kind of suggests that, that life without hope is like being in a room where there's no exit, no way out. Paul calls it a helmet, and he points to the protective qualities of, of hope. Peter talks about a living hope because the, really, the real hope connects us to the Christ who has conquered death. We can go on and look at this. But it is a necessary word, friends. Not a good word, not an important thing, not a useful word, but a necessary word of truth. That your life needs to be anchored in genuine faith in Christ, in true love for the saints, and in the hope that comes from heaven itself. That's constitution. That's the ground for our citizenship in the kingdom of God. And so can I say this just at the end? It bears fruit where? In the whole world. Do you see that? That always blows me away. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world. Some of you are timid when you share your faith. Or maybe it's just me, you know, I need it, and this is kind of my crutch, and this is my, I need it. And people may say that to you. But this is God's truth. Everywhere it is, it grows. It grows with extraordinary power. There, there is not a soil 
there is not a climate, there is not a place where it does not have the power to sink its root and bring out new life. Yes? I hope you hear this, friends. It is too easy to kind of get lost, and yet we add this on. This is the point. The power of this is so strong, that gospel, that it can bear fruit anywhere, everywhere, in all people's lives, in every tribe, in every geographical area of the globe. In fact, it is so strong that in the world they used to not be Christian. There are now more Christians than other things. Have you heard that? Have you thought of that? There are now more Christian missionaries be sent out from the global south than from the historic global north where that has been Christians before. I hope you hear what Paul, what scripture, what God is speaking. I've tried to not say anything beyond what the word says here. But if we are to make the kind of difference that we can make, the kind of gifting that God has given us, with the kind of sense of necessary truth that is here. You all have neighbors. You all have friends. You all have workmates. You all have classmates. You all have all these things that need to see that this is a necessary word for human flourishing. You know, we live in a generation. We have it all. Don't we have it all? We have it all. More than any generation has ever had. We have everything, and yet we're not happy. We don't flourish because we don't have what truly matters. 